YouTube. Welcome back to another History Teacher Reacts video, Mr. Terry, as I continue my search for historical knowledge found here on the internet. All right, today I watched uh, SpaceX's historic uh, mission today, and that was that it was the first time that they had uh, put people into space, as they're sending a couple astronauts up to the ISS. And groundbreaking the way that it's a commercial company first to put people up there, and for the United States, um, it was big for uh, for them because they have not launched their astronauts into space from the United States since the space shuttle program ended uh, nearly 10 years ago. So it's a big moment um, for you know space travel and technology really achievements. And I wanted to it was kind of inspired me to to learn more about the history of space travel. Astronomy is one of my uh, other big hobbies, right? I like history, I like gaming, I like sports, I like astronomy. I have since I was a little kid and space travel has always fascinated me. And looking around for videos and stuff on, on that, I saw and didn't know that one of my favorite channels, Extra History, did a little mini series on the history of space travel. And I thought, let's do it. So that's what we're gonna start today. So episode one is history of space travel, looking to the stars. So we're gonna start with this. Um, now they do smaller multi-part episodes that are about 10 minutes. So we'll go through that. So make sure that you're following along. I'll put what part number is in the video. And so you can keep going with, with the ones that come out. All right, the original video link is gonna be down below. I really appreciate it. If you went and got them um, a view and watched uh, the full one with them or even just watch it right now and then you can come back or play it while you're watching this whatever um, either way to support that channel they're awesome and supportive of this channel okay all right we're gonna go ahead and get started I wish I had a space helmet I don't have a space helmet otherwise I'd put it on on the plains of Britain a man stands looking to the heavens it's Link. soon his whole tribe will drag great stones here Stone to mark the passage of the days meanwhile in Central America a Mayan scholar observes the moon Suddenly, realization dawns. The cycle of the moon repeats every 18.6 years. Soon they'll create the That's first amazing. lunar almanac. How, how do you know that kind of precision? It's amazing mathematically what these ancient cultures like the Mayans. The Mayans were some of the leading um, astronomers in the whole world at their time, right? Which would have been the early Middle Ages for Europe. Uh, they were super advanced with mathematics and with uh, with astronomy. They had all kinds of star charts and um, calendars that were accurate. It's truly amazing what they accomplished. I can't believe just with with just just like astronomical knowledge and ability, what these ancient societies were able to do. In China, an astronomer stares directly at the blinding sun. Laboriously and carefully, he records sunspots for the first time and then we hear in a, human a history. Example. And a priest stands on a ziggurat in ancient Babylon, gazing into the night. Ziggurats are cool. In his hand, a tablet, cuneiform. and on it, cuneiform. With it, oldest, he will use mathematics form of writing, if you didn't know. to unlock the secrets hidden in the sky. There's one thing that all humanity shares. We all look to the stars. You know, one of the benefits that the benefits that came from charting movement of stars and heavenly bodies was to make accurate calendars. Now, accurate uh, calendars were invented primarily to be char uh, to chart seasons for farming. So, being able to chart that had uh, a benefits just to everyday society. Real quick before we continue, we wanted to thank the folks at Digital Extremes for sponsoring this series. Like many of us, the infinite possibilities of space inspired them, and it helped shape their design of Warframe, the quintessential spacefaring free-to-play co-op shooter fun game. that you can and totally should check out in the link below. And they asked us to share humanity's journey to the stars, from its first halting steps to the technologies the future might bring, in hopes that it inspires that same passion in all of you. Thanks, DE. On to the show. At first, the celestial bodies were gods, and the heavens were just that, heavens. Understanding them served one purpose, divination. The augury of the stars spoke to the rise and fall of kings, or the displeasure of the deities. And I mean, think how hard they would be to kind of explain if you're an ancient culture about, you have no concept of the distance that they, that stars and just heavenly bodies are, and what their chemistry is and all that stuff, so you tie it to cultural values right it's it's you know it can be a lot of things yeah it's a deceased ancestor it's literally the heavens whatever you know and so understanding them was a vital service 
or so scholars and priests would tell kings. Thus, astronomy became the first truly state-funded science. Though in many places, it it's wasn't a science too. as we understand it. Cosmology, religious belief, and symbolic interpretation played as much of a part in most early astronomy as empirical study did. And what astronomy there was, was really just in service of astrology. But then, something incredibly useful was discovered all across the globe. Studying the stars could help you keep track of time. Having a calendar was powerful for everything from agriculture to politics. It yeah, I mean, so seasons, so knowing when to when when to do crops and stuff like that uh place like uh, the the nile in egypt floods on a in a on an annual cycle and with an accurate calendar then you could prepare up to you know within a few days probably and be able to prepare the, for the uh, prepare the floods and that stuff it let you know when to begin planting and it let kings tell the world how long they'd ruled or when their greatest victories took place and so astronomy evolved now, that's not to say that it lost its elements of superstition, but especially in Babylon, where Still bureaucracy does, right? and civil administration had started to grow, very accurate records of celestial observations began to take place. And this was followed by the application of mathematics to better understand and predict the movement of the stars. Hmm. But even as Babylon fell into decline, another state began to rise. One that loved a very special form of mental exercise, geometry. This state was, of course, Greece. Granted, yeah. it wasn't a state like any modern states. Rather, it was more like a hodgepodge of rival cities that often had little more than a language in common. Yep. However, there's no for, there's no nation of Greece. Never never was. All of their antagonism, some things they did share, were scholarship and intellectual pursuits. And it was with wonder that they looked up and saw the most complicated geometrical puzzle ever created hanging above them every night. So naturally, they took to applying geometry to astronomy and began the first real breakthroughs into what we might think of as astronomy today, but in a way that might seem odd to us in the modern world. Because to the ancient Greeks, geometry was not only a form of mathematics, it also held mythical and philosophic properties, which mm. led them to believe that everything in the heavens could only move in perfect circles. I mean, that was that was a lot of things, until you guys like Kepler and stuff, where you start getting the orbits are, are different. So even when... They understood the movement of these planets, and um, even when you had heliocentrism, which is sun-centered, the, the still common belief there was a lot of perfect circles. That's what happened um, earlier on. Then, as you know, the the scientific revolution went on, they started adding pieces like that, like that they're not they're not circular, they're elliptical. This caused a huge problem with something called retrograde motion. You see, if you look up night after night and track the motion of a planet like Mars, it'll appear to move east compared to the stars. But for a few months out of the year, it'll seem to move backwards. And this is how they also were determined that uh, the stuff isn't, these, these bodies are not going around the Earth, right? Um, they look kind of like it, but if you actually track them, you see, no, that's why they're doing that, because they're going in these other patterns. To retreat west across the sky. Why? Well, as we know today, it's basically when the Earth laps it. So imagine the Earth and Mars as two race cars. Earth is on the inside track, Mars is on the outside. Go Earth! Well, for a little while, as Earth passes Mars, from the perspective of someone sitting in the passenger seat on Earth, it'll look like Mars is sliding backwards. This behavior is really hard to account for if you're putting Earth at the center of the solar system, and even harder to account for if you, a priori, decide that celestial bodies are perfect, and thus can only move in the perfect geometrical shape. They, they're always about... A lot of the Greek civilizations about like this this idea of perfection, like you have a perfect this and that, and um, yeah, that was actually a big part of just Greek culture in general. They thought certain things were perfect, like the Spartans, for example, thought their constitution was like perfect. Um, yeah, that that like like uh, um, trying to achieve perfection and everything. The circle. To oh, deal with it, you end up having to create something that looks like the planets are on wheels moving on wheels. They mm. called them epicycles. And man, do they make the solar system look oh, I know they super that complex. It's actually what but happened. But even with that, that the Greeks were able to make some shockingly accurate predictions about the motion of the stars. And by the second century BCE, a guy named Hipparchus realized that the old Babylonians had made astonishingly precise observations of the stars because he somehow got his hands on their data. From there, it was <laughs> off to the races. Greek models and predictions lined up more and more with observable events. 
All this work sort of culminated in Ptolemy's Almagest, a giant compendium of geometrical proofs describing the motion of heavenly bodies. Ptolemy was was huge um, for the fact that his 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 I know his charts and stuff become basically the prevailing idea of of the um, structure of the solar system all the way basically until uh, Galileo when you start getting uh, heliocentrism and that kind of thing and understanding orbits better so the idea that you have this kind of round earth and then stuff is going around it it's, it was geocentric unfortunately so unfortunately with Ptolemy it also kept astronomy back for centuries but it did understand movement of things just not the centricism even though it has earth at the center and the odd wheels on wheels epicycles it's so accurate in what it predicts that it took almost 1500 years for people to find a better way to do it in fact it's almost impossible to be able to tell that its predictions aren't perfect with observations theory. that can be done with the naked eye it basically took us inventing telescopes to be able to observe okay. with such exactitude that we could see that Ptolemy's work didn't totally line up with observable events. Okay, so this makes a little bit more sense to me about, because I've wondered why they held on to Ptolemy so long. We know now is different. But basically, it's like every known tracking we had done and technology available to us still conform to the predictions about that because it's all about predictions if you can make accurate predictions about heavenly bodies around then you stick with that basically as the um, observed effect and kind of as a true statement right uh, until you have other means till new evidence arises and they weren't able to get a lot of new evidence until you got the telescopes and stuff that like Galileo was able to build more powerful than anything else and you start seeing other things that can contradict that so it made with all the evidence available still at that time was um confirming what ptolemy was saying so that makes a little bit more sense and less maybe criticism of, of ignorance and more to well that's what the evidence showed then and it was you could you could confirm it or at least uh, back it up the almagest became the principal astronomical text for europe and the arabic world all the way until the renaissance it wouldn't be until copernicus that there was a major challenge to it but everyone looked to the stars, and major advances were happening across the globe. When Alexander rode out of Macedon and stormed through the ancient world, he brought with him not only war and destruction, but also learning. The conquest which made his name legend to this day also brought Greek astronomical thought as far east as India. Yep. And from there, peace is even passed Hellenism. to China. But 700 years later, as Rome fell and the light of learning passed out of Europe, it's these other parts of the world that kept the torch lit and moved forward our understanding of the stars. Yeah, you get golden ages of, uh, academic golden ages of the Islamic world and with India, and they're the ones, you know, interestingly, it wasn't Europeans necessarily that were preserving that ancient Greek and Roman knowledge. It was these uh, um, outside groups, again, like, like the Islamic kingdoms and the ones that preserved that stuff while Europe was going in their dark age. In India, the Surya Siddhanta was published, establishing the length of a year at 365.25636267 days. Only Why do you get it that far? I mean, I know the whole 365 of a year and a quarter, at 365.25636. Getting the other digits, you're getting to like the hundreds and thousands place. It's two seven days, only 1.4 seconds off from where we'd peg it today. Ideas of gravitation and the laws of attraction bounce around times. India, while Arab traders pick up astronomical texts to bring back to the expanding Muslim empires. Al-Khwarizmi, the great Persian scholar who gave us the words algebra and algorithm, yeah, translated some of these works and began to calculate we astronomical charts classes. for himself, bringing a revolution in the approach to astronomy in the Islamic world. By the 10th century, Islamic astrolabe. scholars had developed the astrolabe and are starting to question some of- Astrolabe is, uh, is, is a navigation device for sailors um, to determine latitude. The assumptions made by Ptolemy. And meanwhile in China, the armillary sphere has been invented. And for centuries, the practice of using water clocks to better measure celestial events has been in place. By the beginning of the second clocks. millennium, cool. the Chinese had even erected a large clock tower that displayed in real time the position of the stars. That is awesome. I want one of these or to have, we should have these like in our city centers. That would be so cool. They'd even Forget calculated magnetic to north to aid navigation. But perhaps the greatest Chinese contribution to our quest for the stars came from a wholly different field. 
Because by the 13th century, just as the first primitive lenses were being ground out in Europe, we get the first mm. record of rockets oh, being yeah. used in war. Desperate to stop the Mongols, the yeah. Song Dynasty developed whatever experimental weaponry they could invent. Hand grenades, cannons, and of course, rockets. Didn't matter. They still lost to the Mongols. None of this stuff ended up mattering. And a lot of this technology ended up getting co-opted actually by the, the Mongols and then transferred out west where a lot of more of the, the of, uh, uses of gunpowder ended up being built upon, not necessarily in China early on, but then over in Europe with invention of muskets and cannons and stuff like that. So the Mongols actually ended up transferring this, especially after they conquered China. But to no avail. Despite their technology, before the century was out, the Song were crushed. But as the Mongols swept westward, they brought with them these terrifying weapons of war. First to the Middle East, and then to Europe. And though primitive, they truly began our path to the stars. But before we can get to the stars, one thing we first rockets. One thing, if you're interested, rockets were kind of useful for, is they could scare horses. Um, they could mess with the horses. They don't like the noises and stuff. First, have to understand them. So join us next time as we cover the strides forward in our understanding during the Renaissance and the Enlightenment. Sweet. Tenno, Whoa. I've detected intruders in your orbiter. I've instructed Ordis to open the airlock. Airlock? What? Wait, no, 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 no. Lotus, Lotus, it's me. Can you are not the operator. Identify yourself. It's me, Matt from Extra Credits. Ah, uh, yes, Zoe's pet. Well, that's not exactly how I would describe it, but... How did you get aboard this orbiter? You know, it's a funny story. Zoe and I had just come back from lunch, and we found this great Tex-Mex joint. I got a burrito, and Zoe got this tomato and cheese gazpacho. You, you like cheese, Going don't you? On. Enough. We do not have time for this. A Corpus warship is on the move. You must find a squad and engage them in ship-to-ship -ship combat. Oh, Warframe. dang. You're talking about Empyrean, aren't you? Yes, 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 yes. I've been so hyped for this since its announcement. I mean, come on. Four-player co-op on my Railjack, dogfighting against super tough enemies, working together to stop boarding parties, and even strapping on the old Arcwing to fly through frickin' space to board other enemy ships. I mean, who in their right mind wouldn't be hyped for that? Oh, by the way, I call dibs on the Arcwing part. With whom are you calling dibs? We are the only ones here. You know, the audience. Then gather this audience and prepare for the fight of your life. You got it, Lotus. Zoe, quick, get my Oberon Prime cosplay. Ugh. It's a good game. All right, awesome. I'm, I'm, I'm already, like, excited for this to, to just get more and stuff like that. I loved hearing and reviewing a little bit for me uh, some of the, the ancient knowledge and that kind of stuff that's that's been awesome hopefully i was able to add a little bit and then as we know p things are really going to get interesting once the renaissance hit and we start seeing the scientific revolution with the, uh, johannes kepler and tuco brahe and um galileo and uh da -da -da, copernicus like all these guys that uh, built upon each other they would were often students of the one before and then would make adjustments and get new discoveries, you know? So for the, like heliocentrism, but they still thought things went in like uh, circular orbits and then you get, okay, so it's actually uh, elliptical orbits, right? And then you get confirmation like with Galileo and building his telescopes and able to see the moons of Jupiter orbit uh, Jupiter and to confirm this stuff and see how they built upon each other and how that also rocked kind of rock the world and uh and and their understanding and then hopefully they get into stuff with the inquisition and stuff like that where a lot of this progress was um going to be kind of censored in a way like what they do with galileo putting him in house arrest and making him try to recant um his findings and stuff like that but i'll let, i'll leave that discussion for the future episodes which i'm sure they'll get into which will be very interesting to see kind of the history also of the reaction to space discoveries and how society has dealt with that um, sticking so long for millennia to the ptolemaic idea and ptolemaic um, structure uh, for so long obviously made it harder to to get away from that so all right well i'm excited hopefully you are too and you'll keep joining me on my journey this is awesome because it's history and it's astronomy two of my favorite academic pursuits and I hopefully you'll uh, you'll join me, um, continue to join me on this. All right, original video again is down below. Um, thanks for making sure you uh, you do that. A couple shout outs on the way out. Join my uh, sorry, so uh, join and sub to my my gaming channel, Mr. Terry Gaming. Um, you will see a link in the description for that. Um, from this point on, I'm probably gonna do base most of my gaming related stuff over there. And love to have you around, be to be a part of that community. Join the Discord server. Thanks you to patrons. Um, that have been supporting the channel, channel members, all that good stuff. But thank you just for watching and being a part of our community here. And 
uh, promoting him in a small way, history education on YouTube. All right, with that, we'll see you guys next time. Bye.